what's up donuts i'm getting on here and i wanted to do a couple of things and let you know a couple of things number one always an advisory as always i don't know what's gonna come out of my mouth if i stick to the script then we're good if not then you just never know the details of the crime it's horrible the autopsy is just literally soul crushing so i just wanted to give you a heads up on that and number two this is the month of June. June signifies a couple of things. June 19th is Juneteenth. Also, it is Pride Month. So every episode in this month will have something to do with a LGBT member, except the very first one, the one you're listening to right now. Although he has nothing to do with the LGBT community, the anniversary of his death will be June 7th. I've been putting this story off for like months because I've been reading the details on it and it's just been crushing my whole spirit. But I wanted to bring it to you and I hope you enjoy it. So with that being said, listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, Donuts. Welcome to another episode of Fright Dough, your weekly fix of true crime. I'm your girl, Gina, and I am very excited to have you here with me today. If you're new to the Fright Dough community, welcome. We are a group of true crime enthusiasts who come together to explore the most fascinating cases out there. And to my regular Donuts, thank you for your continued support and loyalty. I really do appreciate it. But before we jump into today's story, I want to remind you to follow this podcast and review it on whatever podcast platform you're listening to my voice on right now. And join our community on Instagram at Fried Dough Podcast. You can send me case suggestions through there. And as always, I want to remind listeners that the stories that I cover on this podcast may be difficult to hear. However, it is very important to shine a light on these cases and remembered the victims who were affected. This is Fried Dough, True Crime Podcast, and this is the story of James Byrd Jr., a tragic chapter in the fight for justice. June 7, 1998, police officers responded to a call. It was reported that a body was found in front of a church by a cemetery. It was a black man. His body was torn apart for a lack of a better description. The police officers initially thought that it was a hit and run. For Sheriff Rose, it was probably the most violent hit and run he had ever seen. They thought that the victim was crushed underneath the vehicle and maybe rolled a little bit underneath, but he was very confused about the brown trails on the road. At first, it looked like tire tracks, but not quite. However, it was something that had drugs side by side along the road. Police followed the dark, rusty color trail another mile and a half up Huff Creek. Along the way, they found various items, including keys, a torn shirt, an undershirt, a watch, a pair of sneakers, a set of dentures, a wallet. Inside the wallet was a photo identification. The identification was for James Berg Jr., who was a resident of Jasper, Texas. Even with the ID present, it was still impossible to confirm the victim due to the nature of his injuries. These were James's items, but the question at that time was, what were they doing 10 minutes away from his home? James Berg Jr. was born May 2nd, 1949 in Beaumont, Eastern Texas, to his parents, James Sr. and Stella Berg. He was the third of eight children and only one of two boys. James grew up with his family in Jasper near the Texas-Louisiana border, a town of 8,000 residents, and 45% of the population was African American. It's 130 miles northeast of Houston and 250 miles from Dallas. As a child, James was reported to be a bright cooperative student and was a joker. Was He was just a happy child. 
James had a talent for sports and was popular with students and teachers alike. They all loved him. He attended Greater New Bethel Baptist Church with his family, where his father was a deacon and his mother was the Sunday school teacher. James graduated school in 1967, and that was the last segregated class in Jasper's Row High School. James' real love was music, which began in elementary school. It was said that he sounded just like Al Green. He was a gifted musician. James mastered several instruments, including the guitar, a trumpet, piano, in addition to developing a singing voice that was often in demand by family at social gatherings. Two of James' favorite songs was I Believe I Can Fly and Prince classic Purple Rain. James will always tell everybody that he was going to put Jasper, Texas on the map. But no one wanted or expected it to be in this way. In 1968, James met his future wife, Thelma. Two years after that, the couple married and had three children, Renee, Rose, and Jamie. By this time, James had already done prison time for theft. He was in and out of correctional facilities over the next 25 years for, for fraudulent parole violation, including seven years sentence for theft in 1990. I was going to omit this segment from this story because I didn't want nobody to think that I was focusing on the negative of Mr. Bird's life. However, because it is part of his life, I decided to put it in. It doesn't matter what Mr. Bird has done in his life or what his vices were. He did not deserve what he ultimately got. So with that being said, James and Thelma eventually divorced in 1993 and the children were raised by their mother in Lufkin, Texas. But despite his run-ins with the law throughout his life, adult life, James was a proud and loving father. He certainly wasn't the kind of person to go out of his way to hurt others, as well as being a caring family man. His sister later described her big brother to the Washington Post, saying he was the kind of person who never wanted to be alone. He would be able to walk up to a group and join right in. He was a very intelligent person, and his family told him he never used his full intellect. But like everybody, he had his faults. The most harm he ever did was to himself. He was never the kind of person who would harm others. When James was released from prison in the summer of 1996, 47-year-old James Bird returned to Jasper, Texas, The New York Times reported that James has struggled on and off with alcohol use since he was a teen. He was determined to turn his life around. After his release, he started attending meetings. At one stage, James worked as a vacuum cleaner salesman, but because of ongoing seizures and chronic arthritis, eventually saw him receiving disability check. So public transportation in Jasper, Texas was non-existent. It wasn't uncommon to see residents walking to get around, nor was it unusual for residents to offer people ride if they saw them walking through the town. James didn't own a car and he couldn't drive due to his medical condition, so he walked everywhere or hitchhiked. Even if Jasper residents didn't know his name, they knew him on site and had no problem offering him a ride. It is what people in Jasper did, and James always gracefully accepted the ride. On the afternoon of Saturday, June 6, 1998, James attended a bridal shower for his niece at his parents' home. James enjoyed socializing with his extended family at the celebration, especially his grandbaby. Around 6 p.m., James left the gathering, walking to his friend's house to another gathering on the other side of town past Highway 96. The occasion was a 20th wedding anniversary party. Friends later saw James enjoying himself, laughing, singing, and dancing with other guests and enjoying their company. At 1.30 a.m., James had consumed a large amount of alcohol and started to head home. A friend of James saw him walking along the side of the road, staggering in his drunken state because of the level of 
intoxication that he had and he just knew that James was on his way home and he was going to get there safely. James was only a mile away from his home. By now, the brown trail led to a dirt road in the woods. The end of the road opened to a clearing. Police found footprints and a broken beer bottle, which led them to the belief that it was a scuffle there. They also found other items, such as three cigarette butts, a KISS CD, a can of tire sealant, a can of black spray paint, a pack of cigarettes, empty beer bottles, a wrench set with the inscription Barry written on it, and the Barry was spelled B-E-R-R-Y, a baseball cap, a button from the shirt found earlier in the road, a Zippo lighter with the inscription Possum on one side and KKK on the other. The two S's in the word Possum of the lighter were lightning bolts, and the three K's were in a triangle. I'm assuming none of these monsters had their licenses on them, or they probably would have left that too. They found human remains in the total of 81 locations, up to a mile away from where the remains were dumped in front of the church. When they confirmed that the remains were James Bird Jr. through fingerprints, this was the time that Sheriff Rose realized that the dark stains in the road was blood and not what he thought, which was tire rubber. Sheriff Rose, he really didn't know what happened. He thought it was a hit and run, but a woman came forward and told him that there was a head close to her property. No information was released about the individual of the victim, but word got around town. Someone came forward believing that he witnessed something, but he did not know what. He went to the sheriff's office. It happened to be a friend of James's, but he didn't know that James was the victim at that time. The man told law enforcement that he drove down Martin Luther King Drive between the time of 2.30 and 2.45 Sunday morning. He said he saw James walking along the road. He could tell that his friend was heavily intoxicated from the way he was swaying from side to side and stumbling as he walked along. The man drove on and not long after he arrived at his destination when he saw a pickup truck pass by, which he described as being primer gray in color. James was in the bed of the pickup truck and three white men were riding up front in the cab. The information provided helped the police. That description of the 1982 pickup truck matched one owned by a local resident, Sean Berry. This provided a lead to bring Sean in for questioning. Sean Berry was a 23-year-old known by the police and was raised by his grandmother. His mother left him when he was around three years old. Sean was good in school and he enjoyed going, but when Sean was 15 years old, he suffered a devastating loss. The man he'd only known as his father took his own life. The impact on Sean was very hard. He started skipping school until he eventually dropped out of Jasper High School in the ninth grade. Sean soon found a job stacking groceries so he could contribute financially to the household. Sean was well-liked and maintained his steady mixed-race group of friends in his spare time. He enjoyed bull riding at local rodeos, enjoyed riding around Jasper with his brother Lewis. Sean continued to look for better-paying jobs until he landed construction work. Unfortunately for Sean, he was easily led astray. In 1992, Sean served three months in a prison boot camp over his involvement in a burglary with a friend named Bill, who Sean had known since high school. Following his release on probation in January 1993, Sean started dating a local girl named Christy, and soon after, they welcomed a baby boy. Despite a drunk driving conviction in 1996 and his tendencies to pick fights other than just walking away, Sean largely managed to stay out of trouble with the law. He found a stable job as a manager of the Jasper Twin Cinema early mid-1998. He and Christy had their last explosive argument, and soon he moved out. Sean moved in with his friend Bill, whom he stayed in contact with since they were in prison together five years earlier. Around May, another friend of Bill's named Russell Brewer also moved in following his release from prison. 
So around 9 p.m. on the evening of June 7, 1998, police stopped Sean in his pickup near the Jasper Twin Cinema parking lot over outstanding traffic tickets. When officers searched the pickup behind the front seat, they found a tool set matching the wrench found at the crime scene, along with an empty KISS CD case. The pickup truck was confiscated, Sean was arrested, and escorted to the sheriff's office, where the investigators started questioning him. It was some hours before Sean cooperated. District Attorney Guy James Gray had been called to help elicit information from Sean to move the investigation forward. Sean was shown items recovered at the crime scene, including his tools and the Zippo lighter. Finally exhausted after hours of questioning, Sean blurted out, they wanted to fuck with an N-word. The people that Sean was talking about was John William Bill for short, King, and he was Sean's longtime friend, and Lawrence Russell Brewer. Brewer was a white supremacist. 23-year-old John William King, known as Bill, was born in Atlanta, Georgia. As a baby, was adopted by Ronald and Jean King, who already had three children. When Bill was a toddler, the family moved to Jasper, Texas. Bill grew up in a loving and protective family environment. He was reported to be an intelligent and capable student. He attended church with his family and made friends easily. Just like his parents, Bill had both black and white friends. But being adopted and a great deal younger than his siblings, he was doted on by his parents, who were said to spoil him at times. But when Bill was 16 years old, his mother, who he was real close to, she passed away. According to the Beaumont Enterprise newspaper, Bill soon started engaging in antisocial behaviors like stealing alcohol, cigarettes, no longer interested in school. He dropped out of Jasper High School in the 10th grade. He found manual work, but his illegal activities were about to come to an attention to the authorities. In May of 1992, the 16-year-old was put on 10 years probation following the arrest of a burglary. By this time, he had reunited with Sean Berry. But unable to stay out of trouble, in September 1992, the pair were arrested for a second burglary and sentenced to three years in the same boot camp. Both men were released in January 1993. With Sean managing to stay in the, on the straight and narrow for the most part, they violated their parole in June 1995. This time, the 20-year-old was sent to a notorious maximum security unit to serve an eight-year sentence. It was during this stint in prison that Bill shared a cell with inmate Lawrence Brewer, known by his middle name, Russell. While the two men were serving time, they aligned themselves with the CKA, a white supremacy group finding protection within the prison gang. Bill adopted the nickname Possum. On Bill's release date, he moved to Jasper into a one-bedroom apartment with his girlfriend, Kylie, who shortly moved out after she became pregnant the spring of 1998. By this time, Bill had accumulated a lot of racist tattoos, a pentagram behind the ear, a swastika, lightning bolts, which is a sign for the KKK of some kind. I didn't look too deep into it, so screw it. The words Aryan pride, a woodpecker in a Ku Klux Klan dress making an obscene gesture, a crest with the Confederate flag in a burning cross. Another tattoo was a black man hanging from a tree, and he especially would like to show this one off, saying, do you want to see my little N-word hanging from a tree? So Russell Brewer was 31 years old, and he was raised in Sulphur Spring, Texas, 50 miles from Dallas, one of five children in a strict military and religious family, Russell wasn't an outgoing child. He kept to himself. He also attended church with his family where he sang in the choir and entering his early adolescence, Russell began doing drugs. His parents, Lawrence Sr. and Helen, kicked him out of the home and Russell dropped out of high school. Russell did try to turn things around at the age of 17 years old by moving back home and joining the National Guard. 
However, the lure for drugs was strong and Russell soon relapsed, turning to theft to finance his habit. So in late 1986, 19-year-old Russell was convicted and sentenced for a burglary charge. He was paroled in 1988 and was again convicted in May 1989 for drug possession. He received 15 years and was released on parole in May 1991. In 1993, 26-year-old Russell married an Hispanic woman who became the mother of his son. And even with a child, it wouldn't keep him out of prison. He went back to jail where he met Bill and they shared their same racist ideologies. In the first of what would be seven statements, some conflicting others, Sean told police that around 1245, the night before he was driving around town in his pickup with his friends, Bill and Russell. The trio was drinking beer when they came upon an African-American man walking along Martin Luther King Drive and Highway 96. Sean recognized the man from around town but didn't know his name. Sean slowed the pickup to offer the man a ride and he accepted, climbing into the rear bed of the pickup. Sean said Bill then turned against him angrily, exclaiming, that's a fucking N-word. You don't need to be picking up a fucking N-word. Bill's outburst seemed to subside and Sean turned the pickup around. They were on Highway 63 traveling eastward. During the ride, Sean offered the African-American man a beer and a cigarette. Sean told police that after a while, the group stopped at a convenience store east of Jasper when Bill took over driving. The man who police now know as James sat in the front seat besides Bill as he drove. Sean claimed that Bill drove the pickup in an eastern direction in a wooden area right outside of Jasper, where they turned off of the highway onto Logging Road headed towards Huff Creek. They continued to drive until the pickup came to a clearing in the dark wooden area, which was isolated. There were no house lights or street lights nearby. Sean told police that upon reaching the clearing, Bill stopped the pickup saying, I'm fixing to scare the shit out of this N-word. Sean claimed that Bill and Russell got out of the pickup offering James a beer. According to Sean, his companions pulled James out of the pickup and threw him onto the ground, punching, kicking, and even stomping on him till he stopped moving. Russell then grabbed the can of spray paint and sprayed black spray paint onto James's face. Sean told police that he was petrified and lost control of his bladder. He wanted nothing to do with what he just witnessed. So Sean ran off. But a short time after, Bill and Russell returned along the path in Sean's pickup, ordering Sean to get into his pickup. Sean said as far as he was aware, Bill and Russell had left James unconscious in the clearance. Sean asked Bill if he was just going to leave James in the middle of nowhere. Bill responded, we're starting the Turner Diaries early. The Turner Diary is an extreme racist and anti-Semitic novel talking about a race war. Sean told police that when Bill turned the pickup back onto Huff Creek Road, he accelerated. Russell glanced in the rear window saying that black man is bouncing all over the place. Sean claimed that only at this time he realized that his friends tied James' ankles together with a logging chain, dragging him along the bumpy road behind the pickup. Sean told police he asked Bill to stop his own truck so he can get out of his own truck and Bill refused, threatening Sean, telling him that you're just as guilty as we are. Besides, the same thing can happen to an quote-unquote N-word lover. In his police statement, Sean said that Bill beat James and drug him along the road because he wanted to quote-unquote teach him a lesson. Bill got out of the pickup and unchained James. By this time, James had been decapitated, which happened when the pickup rounded the bend and struck a culvert. These monsters dumped James' mutilated remains in front of a black church and took off, later returning home 
to their apartments to go to sleep. They were able to go home, be so relaxed, and actually fall asleep. Sean Berry's statements confirm law enforcement's worst fear. If what Sean said was true, Sheriff Rhodes himself said that he didn't know the definition of a hate crime, but he did know that James had been brutally murdered based on nothing more than the color of his skin. The sheriff's office immediately contacted the FBI and Beaumont for assistance. The FBI agents searched the one-bedroom apartment where Sean, Bill, and Russell lived. Investigators seized clothes and shoes belonging to the three men, as well as a large quantity of meat and beer, which had been earlier reported stolen by a local restaurant. But what concerned police more was the discovery of drawings and writing documents belonging to Bill. What he had written on pieces of paper were constitutions, bylaws, code of ethics, and he had a membership application for a group called the Texas Rebel Soldiers. The club appeared to be a branch of the hate group known as the Confederate Knights of America, or the CKA, or reported to have associations with the Ku Klux Klan. Bill and Russell were both on parole at the time of the murder, they agreed to accompany the police back to the station for questioning over the meat and beer found in the apartment. Possessions of the stolen good meant the men would be charged for parole violations. Both, of course, denied any involvement with James's murder, but investigators knew that Bill and Russell were more involved than what they claimed. The Washington Post reported that the night after James' body was found, Bill told police that the evening before, he and Russell picked up Sean following his shift at work. Sean dropped him and Russell off back at the apartment. According to Bill, Sean then headed off to meet James to finalize a drug deal. Bill told police the drug deal must have fallen through, claiming that Sean had an irate temper and must have killed James as a result. Bill confirmed that he owned the Zippo lighter engraved with possum and KKK, stating that he lost it prior to the murder. Bill was adamant that he had nothing to do with the murder, of course. Russell said that Sean slit James' throat. Investigators did not believe neither one of those monsters' story. Meanwhile, police continued to question Sean, but like I said earlier, his story kept fluctuating. Sean told police that Russell told him around 5 30 p.m on sunday that they hid the 24 foot chain in a hole covered with plywood and debris behind the house of one of bill's friends and the police located the chain in that exact spot the following day on monday morning police had to break the devastating news to james's family but like other jasper residents they've already heard the rumors but they had no idea james had never made it home from their family celebration James's oldest daughter, Renee, described her father as a fighter to later share with 60 Minutes about the moment she learned of her father's death. They drove up to a remote area. They stripped him of his clothing. They beat him till he was half unconscious. They spray painted his face black. And to inflict more pain, they pulled his pants down. They tied him to the, by the ankles to the back of a gray pickup truck. My father is such a fighter. He stayed alive, doing most of the dragging, trying to keep his elbows off the pavement. And if you fall down and scrape yourself and that hurts, you could just imagine what pain my father felt. Um, that's just a minute aspect of what the pain my father felt that, that night. And the place they took him to was Huff Creek, which is where my mother grew up. And, and there's nothing there but forestry. And it's so dark, and I could just imagine it's so dark. And but he wasn't afraid of nothing. He probably thought they were just going to take him for a ride. And, hang out or whatever. He never thought that there would be the last journey he ever take. The 
This murder was described as a modern day lynching. At the same time, members of both white and black communities in Jasper rallied in support of, of James's family. With yellow ribbons, they were distributed all around town on telephone poles, mailboxes, front porches, all in the name of peace. Then President Clinton spoke against the murder, saying, We must join together across racial lines to demonstrate that an act of evil like this is not what our country is all about. I think we've all been touched by it. I can only imagine that virtually everyone who lives there is in agony at this moment. All right, Donuts, this is why I put the advisory in the beginning because of the autopsy. So I'm letting you know now. James's autopsy revealed that his pants and underwear had been pulled down before he was chained to the rear of the pickup. Constant abrasions around his ankles were consistent with being bound together by a chain. James' body was covered with extensive injuries, including significant brush burns, abrasions consistent with being drugged by his ankles over a road surface. Both knees and part of James's feet had been grounded down. Some of his toes were missing, while others were fractured. Large lacerations on his legs gaped open, exposing the muscle underneath. Both of James' testicles were missing, and gravel was found embedded in his scrotum. His buttocks had been ground down to the sacrum and lower spine. Almost all of his anterior ribs had been fractured. Red regions around the area of James's head, neck, and right arm had been ripped from its torso. Indicate that his heart was still pumping and that he was alive the moment his, he collided with the covert. His buttocks had been ground down to the sacrum and lower spine. Almost all of his interior ribs had been fractured. Red regions around red regions around the area where James's head, neck, and right arm had been ripped off from his torso indicated that his heart was still pumping, meaning that he was still alive the moment that he collided with the covert. James's left cheek was grounded down to the jawbone, but his brain and skull had remained intact throughout the ordeal. And if that wasn't enough, they actually defecated and urinated on James before they chained him to the pickup truck. The wounds indicated that James was not only alive while he was being drugged, but conscious. The helpless man attempted to relieve the unimaginable. The helpless man attempted to relieve the unimaginable agony being inflicted upon him by rolling from side to side as he was being drugged behind the pickup truck. The lack of brain and skull injuries suggest that James had tried to keep his head off the ground while being drugged. Even though the investigators formed a view that Bill King was the ringleader, the volume and the weight of the evidence gathered indicated that the three men were equally responsible. Defense tried to argue that James went with the three men willingly. However, prosecutors proved that once the chains went around James's ankles, James was no longer willing. He was kidnapped. Unfortunately, when it came to a layer of charges, the murder couldn't be prosecuted as a hate crime. So they went for first degree felony and they pursued the death penalty. So Bill and Russell got the death penalty and Sean got life in prison. In 2009, President Barack Obama signed a hate crimes law named after James Byrd Jr. We will strengthen the protections against crimes based on the color of your skin, the faith in your heart, or the place of your birth. Russell was put to death on September 21st, 2011, and was the first white man in Texas who was ever put to death for killing a black man. Bill was put to death April 24th, 2019. Sean was sentenced to life in prison. All right, Donuts, I hope you keep listening. I hope you stay safe, stay vigilant, and always, always, always trust your instincts. What's up, Donuts? It's your girl, Gina. I'm literally just finding this out 
right before this episode dropped. Today is National Donut Day. So if you go to Dunkin' Donuts with purchase, they give you a free donut. Happy National Donut Day. Bye.